welcome. You're watching Gravitas with me, Priyanka Sharma. Here's our big focus tonight. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Thank you. Will she survive the weekend? When will she resign? Will the lettuce outlast the UK Prime Minister? Well, all the speculation, all the rumours, the memes have been put to rest by none other than Liz Truss herself. In a remarkably short address, Liz Truss resigned as a UK Prime Minister today. Now, when we sat down to plan the show earlier today, we wanted to talk about the UK government imploding. We wanted to discuss the ongoing chaos in UK politics, the growing fears of mass resignation from the cabinet. But we didn't get a chance because the biggest resignation came a few hours ago. Liz Truss clearly said, I recognize that I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. She has admitted that she has failed to do her job. There's no other way of saying it. So tonight on Gravitas, we get you the complete picture. What went wrong? What caused this expected but dramatic resignation? Who will take on the job now? Rather, who wants to take on the job? Who's having the last laugh? And most importantly, what happens to the people of the UK? They have lost faith in leadership. They are battling the worst cost of living crisis. Families and businesses are struggling to pay bills. We can't forget that. And also, there's a war raging in Europe. So stay with us. Tonight on Gravitas, we put the spotlight on the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. The lettuce has won. It started as a joke. We had a good laugh about it too. We never thought it could actually happen. But the events of the last 24 hours put the final nail in the coffin for the Trust government. Liz Truss will leave the post of Prime Minister in a matter of one week. Listen in. I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. And with that, one of the most turbulent tenures in British politics has finally ended. Liz Truss moved into 10 Downing Street just 44 days ago. In 44 days, her government has collapsed. This makes Liz Truss the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. Till Wednesday, Truss was defiant. She had told Parliament that she was a fighter, not a quitter. Both Truss, but Truss has lost both the respect of her party and her credibility as a politician. It all began yesterday with a resignation and a chaotic vote in the British Parliament. Let's now recap the last 24 hours for you. It all began with the resignation of Suella Braverman. She was a Home Secretary in the Liz Trust government, basically the equivalent of the Home Minister here in India. Trust has lost her second senior minister in a week now. The first exit was, of course, of Kwasi Kwarteng. He was sacked as the Chancellor of the Exchequer over that disastrous economic plan. We reported on it. So why was Braverman shown the door? She had violated government rules. She used her personal email to share an official document and that led to her resignation. Braverman had been appointed just 43 days back. Look at the chain of events. According to one claim, she is now the shortest serving British Home Secretary since 1834. But who was Suella Braverman? Well, a conservative hardliner and a supporter of restrictive immigration policies. 
She is best known here in Asia for defending British colonialism. Her comments to a British newspaper went viral a few weeks ago. History is complex and nuanced, and I'm not going to apologise for empire. I'm not going to apologise for our past. Yes, yeah, she was talking about the British Empire, the one that colonized and plundered India for 200 years. Braverman won't apologize for the UK's colonial past. She also didn't seem sorry for using personal email for work. She used her resignation to launch a scathing attack on Liz Truss. Allow me now to read some quotes from her letter. There was an apology. I have made a mistake. I accept responsibility. I resign. But the rest of the letter sounds a lot more like a brutal takedown of the outgoing Prime Minister. Consider these statements now. Pretending we haven't made mistakes carrying on as if everyone can't see that we have made them and hoping that things will magically come right is not serious politics. I quote again, it is obvious to everyone that we are going through a tumultuous time. I have concerns about the direction of this government. I have had serious concerns about this government's commitment to honoring manifesto commitments. Yes, she mentioned the word concerns twice. Needless to say, Braverman's assessment was embarrassing for the trust government. The British Prime Minister's day just got worse from that point on. Yesterday, an important vote was scheduled in Parliament. It was about a ban on fracking for shale gas. The trust government wanted to resume fracking and the Conservatives enjoy a majority in Parliament. So the vote should have been a cakewalk. But it wasn't, because conservative lawmakers try to rebel against trusts. Some disturbing reports have emerged from Westminster. Conservative MPs were allegedly bullied and manhandled during the vote. Apparently, Truss's team is said to have used strong arm tactics to secure the votes that she needed. It got that bad. Allegedly, her conservative colleagues were in tears. The scandalous claims led to an uproar in Parliament. And MPs then called for an investigation in the House of Commons. Listen in. Yeah. I saw members yeah. being physically manhandled yeah. into another yeah. lobby yeah. and being bullied. Well, if we want to stand up against bullying in this House of our staff, exactly. we have to stop bullying in this chamber as well, don't we? We have an extremely good system for, it, uh, for investigating allegations of bullying, intimidation or bad behaviour. And if the honourable gentleman cares to bring uh, evidence and facts to me, I will make sure that the matter is properly investigated. Apparently, some lawmakers claim that this vote was being treated as a confidence vote against the trust government. That wasn't the case. But the dissent was out in the open. Conservative lawmakers were slamming the trust government and that too in public. I've had enough of talentless people um, putting their tick in the right box, not because it's in the national interest, but because it's in their own personal interest to achieve ministerial position. There were a dozen conservative MPs who publicly called on trust to quit. Many more were making similar demands in private. Well, they've got their wish. Truss was the UK's Prime Minister in six years. Now, the Conservatives will begin a hunt for a leader number five. But who will step up to take the job? The choice of Liz Truss has blown up in the faces of the Conservatives. The opposition says that the Conservatives have lost the mandate to govern. The Labour, the Liberal Democrats and Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, they have all called for a general election, even allies of the United Kingdom cannot ignore this political instability now. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron spoke out on the situation today. Take a look. I want to say that France, as a friend of the British people, wants stability before all and in the current context, a context of war, of tensions over energy and the wider crisis. It is important for Britain to regain political stability and that's all I want. On a personal level, I am always sad to see a colleague go. And what I want to say is that I would like stability to return as soon as possible. So what can we expect now? To answer that, let's now cut across to London for the latest. 
Joining me now is Andrew Whitehead, a senior journalist from London, and also joining me is our correspondent Laura Macon Isherwood. Welcome to the show, Laura. I'd like to take my first question from you. An exciting day, to say the least, in UK politics. What went wrong? What made Liz Truss the shortest-serving prime minister in British history? Well, there's been plenty of issues that Liz Truss has had to face over the last six weeks, just six weeks that she's been in number 10 as the leader of the Conservative Party and the UK Prime Minister. We've seen, of course, ups and downs with the economy following the decision by both her and her former Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, to unveil a raft of tax cuts for the United Kingdom. That seemed to uh, cause the economy to react badly, the markets and financial markets tanking, essentially, in response to that. And also the value of the pound dropped too. So that was something that perhaps Liz Truss hadn't expected and went against absolutely that uh, plea that she was making that actually her plans were going to stimulate economic growth and make the UK stronger economically. So we had that. She sacked Kwasi Kwarteng, installed a new chancellor, uh, Jeremy Hunt. He then reversed all of those, well, a lot of those, not all of them, but the majority of those tax cutting measures uh, in his first statement to Parliament. And then there were questions, of course, about Liz Truss's credibility. If that was her initial plan to, to, to cut taxes and, and move forward with that, and that had been reversed by her new chancellor, who exactly was leading the party? We then saw just yesterday that resignation from Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary. She resigned because she said she'd sent an email from a personal email address, right. not an official one, and that it was her prerogative, basically, to stand down. And then this morning we saw uh, Sir Graham Brady, the head of the 1922 committee, heading into Downing Street for conversations with Liz Truss there. And whatever was discussed in that room, it was then uh, what led, we think, Liz Truss to stand down. Right, Laura, thanks for that. Andrew, uh, let's come to you now. You've been weighing on this since the news broke. I want to start by quoting the outgoing Prime Minister. She says, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was selected by the Conservative Party. That's a rather dramatic statement, a dramatic resignation. Is she essentially admitting that she failed to do her job? She's admitting that the policies on which she stood for the Conservative Party leadership simply won't work. She stood as a tax-cutting figure. Uh, the mini budget that Kwasi Kwarteng brought in just last, last month was a radical tax cutting series of measures, but without making clear where the money would come from. So the markets took fright, the pound weakened, interest rates were sharply up, and uh, not simply the markets, but her own party lost confidence in her. So that was what we saw uh, happening yesterday with Suella Braverman's resignation. I think, in essence, she was sacked for disloyalty. And those chaotic scenes in Parliament, the Conservative Party has lost any sort of discipline, largely because the opinion polls now put them 30 points behind the opposition Labour Party. So if there was a general election now, which there won't be, but if there was, it's very likely that Labour would win handsomely and the Conservatives would be in opposition for the first time in 12 years. Right. Laura, coming back to you for the latest uh, updates on this story. Uh, it is a fast-evolving situation. Uh, tell us a little bit about the next contender. What happens next? Who's going to take the top job? Uh, reports also suggesting that Boris Johnson is expected to stand in the Tory leadership contest. Well, well, there were lots of questions, of course, when Boris Johnson left his post not that long ago. In his departing speech in Parliament, he used the phrase, I'll be back, uh, or hasta la vista, not the I'll be back. But it sort of got a lot of people talking, wondering whether he uh, may be planning some sort of return to Parliament, whether he expected it this quickly. That's not so certain. However, there are lots of questions around the credibility, of course, of Boris Johnson. Remember, he left amid that cloud of party gate. There's been a lot of questions about his standing, too. So there will be plenty within the Conservative Party wondering whether that might be a good move at all. And, of course, Boris Johnson has not confirmed that that is indeed his intention. We know that the current Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, he's not planning to stand or, or to run to be leader either. He's tried a couple of times before and hasn't quite made it within Conservative Party members, not got enough votes to be elected uh, as the Prime Minister. And so now we're looking at other potential options. Will Rishi Sunak look to right. go for that top job again? Of course, he came second to Liz Truss in the most recent Absolutely, leadership Laura, I want to actually, election. Right, Annie Morden, mentioned... that's another name that's right. being uh, shown around. Right. Uh, Laura, since you mentioned Rishi Sunak, I want to uh, ask Andrew for his opinion. 
Andrew, in your opinion, what's Rishi Sunak thinking about at this point in time? Well, I think the indications are that he will stand uh, for the leadership. We have no confirmation of that, but that's the way it looks. And I think it's likely that once again, he will be the most favoured candidate among Conservative members of Parliament. The key thing is the procedure which is adopted, and we'll know that within the next few hours. If, uh, as last time, the final decision is made by Conservative Party members, so not MPs, but members in the country, then anything could happen. And Rishi Sunak might find himself outflanked either by Penny Mordaunt, who is a right winger who's quite popular in the party in the country, or just possibly, I think it's unlikely, but possibly by Boris Johnson, who's much more popular with Conservative Party members than he is with Conservative MPs. So we really don't know. But I think Rishi Sunak is probably just the favourite. Right. Uh, Laura, the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, has called for an immediate general election in fact, Starmer said that the Conservative Party has shown that it no longer has a mandate to govern. Is this likely to happen? Well, at the moment, it doesn't seem like that is likely. Of course, the Conservatives now are looking around to see what their next option is, who might be a viable leader to put into number 10, replace Liz Truss. But Labour will be pushing for that general election. As uh, Andrew said, at the moment, they're looking really good in the polls. The opinion polls are placing them super highly. And so the thinking is potentially that if a general election was called, then Labour could indeed win. And now it's up to the Conservatives to work out whether they want to run that risk. Right, Laura, thank you so much for joining us on Gravitas tonight. Thanks for all your inputs. Andrew, I want to uh, take this question from you. Now, all this turmoil, uh, these, this revolving door of exits is happening at a time when Britain is battling its worst cost of living crisis. Families and businesses are struggling to pay bills. Has the public lost faith in leadership? I think they have to a large extent. So inflation is over 10%. Uh, food price inflation is at 14%. Fuel prices are going off the scale, so it's a really acute cost of living crisis. And the spurt in interest rates caused by Liz Truss's disastrous mini budget means that people are paying more in interest on their home loans in particular. So people feel very aggrieved. And for quite some time, there's been a lack of confidence in the political class. And I think that the way in which politicians have behaved and this rapid turnover of prime ministers, something that we've never seen before, ever. I mean, three prime ministers in one year when there's no election and really uh, you know, is quite I mean, self-inflicted wounds, basically. So I think the standing of politicians with the public is low. Right. Andrew, also a recent YouGov poll found that most Tory party members would vote for Rishi Sunak if the United Kingdom's uh, prime ministerial polls were to be held now. What could have sparked this change? Well, I think um, those who voted for Liz Truss last time round are clearly feeling rather embarrassed. She's not been a success. It's been a, a personal tragedy for her in many ways, but clearly she's not made the grade. Uh, so they're looking for a new home. I think until a few hours ago, nobody really thought that Boris Johnson would so quickly want to re-enter the political fray. He's actually at this moment on holiday in the Caribbean, even though Parliament is sitting, which says something about his attitude to, uh, to life and his political responsibilities. He is, after all, still a member of Parliament. But I think there has been a swing towards Rishi Sunak. But how people will vote when we see the list of contenders and when we know who the two front runners are, that will be decided by Conservative MPs. I think we haven't really got a clear picture of that as yet. Right. It's also been quite a horrible year for the United Kingdom. Changes in governors continuing to this day. The death of the Queen, of course, and the economy in a bad shape. So what happens now? What kind of challenges is the new leader, whoever he or she may be, is likely to tackle? Well, I think we really want a period of calm. Uh, calm which will reassure the financial market so there's no more sudden moves in the value of currency or in interest rates. I, I think really uh, the public wants to feel that politicians are getting to grips with the real problems, which is not just the cost of living crisis. It's things like the National Health Service, which is acutely short of resources and facing its own 
real crisis this coming winter. There's a whole range of issues which uh, clearly are not being addressed because everybody at Westminster is looking at what's happening to the Prime Minister, who's going to be the next uh, leader of the country, and not really basically doing their jobs. So I think everybody is looking for a period of stability and calm where a new Prime Minister, whoever it is, can play themselves in. The opposition parties clearly are making the case, the sort of the, the moral case for a general election, but there is no constitutional case for a general election. And previously, when a prime minister, as opposed to a government, has resigned, then there's been no election. It's simply a matter of the governing party finding a new leader. And that is overwhelmingly likely to be what happens in the next week or 10 days. Absolutely, Andrew. Thank you so much for all that analysis and thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Now, it was a turbulent tenure for Liz Truss. She took oath of office on the 6th of September. She came in with the promise to help the UK sail through the economic crisis, bring in reform. Truss said she had three priorities for the economy, growth, growth and growth. But her approach was controversial. Earlier this week, a YouGov poll found that only 10%, only 10% of the public supported Truss. YouGov later pointed out that 10% was a record low for any Prime Minister since the survey began some 22 years ago. So what really happened in the last 45 days? What did Trust go, or rather do, to earn such unpopularity? On the 6th of September, Queen Elizabeth II asked Trust to form a government. Two days later, the Queen passed away and the nation plunged into a state of mourning. Truss's first challenge was to oversee that. But four days after the Queen's funeral, Truss's government unveiled the mini-budget. Truss promised a bold plan. She promised to deliver on the energy crisis, endorsed the mini-budget as a new era for the UK economy. But what was in this mini-budget? It scrapped a planned rise in corporate taxes. It cut income tax and stamp duty for home buyers. It also cuts the income tax for the highest earners from 45% to 40%, as most of you rightly remember. The fallout of the mini-budget was massive. The markets were shocked. The pound plunged. The UK government bond yields skyrocketed. So much so that the Bank of England had to intervene with bond buyouts. Whatever it could do to reassure investors. Even the IMF criticized Truss's policies. In a rather rare rebuke, the International Monetary Fund said that Truss's policies, quote-unquote, were likely to increase inequalities. Even the U.S. criticized its ally. President Joe Biden said that he thought Truss's policies were a mistake. By the first week of October, headlines like these were already asking whether Truss is indeed the worst prime minister in the history of the United Kingdom. Kwasi Kwarteng was sacked as Chancellor. He was one of Truss's most loyal allies. His resignation letter read, and I'm quoting, You have asked me to stand aside as your Chancellor. I have accepted. Truss's critics were not convinced. They wanted the Prime Minister to step down. Truss kept insisting that she's a fighter, not a quitter. But at one point, she too had to admit that her policies went too far and too fast. So, she staged an economic reversal, another controversial move, and her new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was given that task. The UK's former Brexit negotiator David Frost likened Truss to Henry VI, you know, the 15th King. Here's what Frost wrote about Truss in the Daily Telegraph. A weak figurehead, unable to control the forces around her, occasionally humiliated, and disposed of when she has become inconvenient. Better to go now. This was a popular opinion that Truss was losing the mandate to stay in office. Truss's own party had lost confidence in her. And it seems that so had the apolitical monarch. During Truss's penultimate week in office, she went to the Buckingham Palace to meet King Charles for her weekly audience. She curtsied and said, your Majesty. King Charles replied, so you've come back again. 
And to that trust replied, it's a great pleasure. Dear, oh dear, replied the British king. The popular displeasure with regard to Truss's policies and her handling of the economic crisis was no secret. In more ways than one, analysts saw her resignation coming. When Truss's Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, resigned, it was the last nail on the coffin. Braverman spared no words to criticize Truss in her resignation letter. We already read that out for you. But I think it's worth a revisit. So allow me to quote now. I'm quoting Braverman, Braverman again, pretending we haven't made mistakes, carrying on as if everyone can't see that we have made them and hoping that things will magically come right is not serious politics. And now on to a question that's on everyone's mind. Who will the UK's next prime minister be? Who is going to succeed Liz Truss? A number of names are doing the rounds. In the next three minutes, we'll look at the profiles of the top five and decode their chances of becoming the UK's next leader. The first name on the list is, of course, Rishi Sunak, the UK's former Chancellor of the Exchequer, also a former candidate to 10 Downing Street. This summer, he ran against Truss in the Tory leadership election. He lost by a slim margin, but still remains the favourite to win. According to the odds checker, which collates the odds of a candidate winning according to the UK's biggest betting sites, Sunak stands the best chance of being the next Prime Minister after Liz Truss. Coming now to front, run, front runner number two, Jeremy Hunt. Less than a week after becoming Chancellor, remember, Hunt is an experienced minister with short stints as the UK's Cultural Secretary, as well as the country's Health Secretary. In 2018, he lost in the final runoff for the top office to Boris Johnson. Could he spring a surprise this time as well? Who knows? But his appointment as the Chancellor has brought him back to centre stage and bolstered his chances of winning. Let's talk about front runner number three, Penny Mordaunt. The leader of the House of Commons, in the last Tory leadership battle, she came within eight votes of beating Truss for a runoff with Rishi Sunak. Analysts say that this was because of her popularity with Tories' grassroots. Also the fact that she was a strong Brexit supporter. Besides being a key figure in the 2016 Leave campaign. Remember, Morden's popularity has risen this week, especially after Monday, when she was sent in place of Liz Truss to take the opposition's question in Parliament over the recent economic turmoil. Her performance has impressed many Tory loyalists. And now on the fourth position is Ben Wallace, the country's current defence secretary. He was first appointed by Boris Johnson and has remained in the position ever since. He has managed to escape the threat of multiple reshuffles that have followed. So why is that? Because he enjoys immense support from the Tory MPs of all kinds. In fact, many of them believe that Wallace should assume leadership with Rishi Sunak serving as a Chancellor once again. That's the combo they prefer. It'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. And finally, on the fifth position is a rather popular name, Keir Starmer, the Labour Party frontman, who's been the leader of opposition since 2020. Yes, some analysts say that the Labour leader also has chances of donning the Prime Minister's hat. He has already called for an immediate general election. And his appeal is finding incredible support from the people. But that said, his chances of winning depend only on Tories agreeing to an election. Until then, this battle remains an internal leadership contest. At the end of it all, we have these five names. Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, Penny Mordaunt, Ben Wallace and Keir Starmer. So who's going to be the lucky one of these five? Who could take on the top job? Well, we shall find out soon enough. And now it's time to get some more perspective from London. Let's go over to Nicholas Nugent, a senior journalist. Nicholas, welcome to the show. Hello. Now, Liz Truss uh, said that she couldn't deliver what she had promised in her speech. What is, was it the policies according to you or the timing that they were announced? 
Uh, sorry, was it the the policy or the timing yes. that has brought her down? Right, exactly. Well, That's uh, my question. It was her. Um, it was the cat handling of what's called the mini budget at the end of September that brought her down. It firstly brought her chancellor down about uh, a week or more ago. Gosh, things are moving so fast. I'm forgetting how long. Um, because it, she, in the mini budget, the Conservative leadership, the government, promised unfunded tax cuts and nothing jitters the market more than not knowing where the money's coming from. So it's all very well to say, I'm giving you back lots of your taxes, I'm going to reduce taxes, but nobody knew where the money was coming from. Were they going to cut government expenditure or were they going to uh, raise some other taxes or were they going to borrow? And the market was left with the conclusion that they were going to borrow massively and hence the market became very jittery uh, um, uh, and, and uh, rates of interest went up to the detriment of the government. In other words, uh, it's going to cost a lot, lot more to borrow the money they need to do. So that's what brought her down. You could encapsulate it and say it showed that she was inept, inexperienced and frankly had uh, a very poor view of economic management. So if you put all those things together, that's what dragged her down. And the means of dragging her down was that she right. lost support from Conservative members of Parliament. Absolutely. Nicholas, let's talk about the next contender. We've just uh, told our viewers about the top five contenders. Who, according to you, is likely to take on the top job and who should take on this job? Well, well let me start with the bottom of your list. Uh, Keir Starmer, no chance, because there is no way an election will happen at the moment. Remember, the right to call an election before time, an early election, belongs to the Prime Minister. And no Conservative Prime Minister is going to call an election at the moment, because if they did, they would be absolutely decimated, or even more than decimated, um, by losing seats in Parliament, because the opinion polls show Labour has an overwhelming majority. So you're right to say that if there were to be an election, Keir Starmer would romp home, but there won't be an election, not in the near future, not certainly not in the next uh, month or so, while the Conservative leadership changes hands. Now, uh, above that list, you had four quite interesting candidates, you're asking me to predict who will be there. Well, I'll predict who I think will be the final two, because that's the point at which it may move from the electorate of the members of parliament to the members of the Conservative Party in the country. I think the final two will be Rishi Sunak and Penny Mordaunt. After all, they were next on the list when Liz Truss was selected. So they are already there with good standing. We've already seen that they have between them quite significant support amongst Conservative members of Parliament. Ben Wallace is an interesting name because that's come up in the first in the last few days, but he didn't contest last time round, and there's no indication so far that he plans to contest this time. Um, but let me say something about Jeremy Hunt. You put him on your list. He has today said he will not be a candidate. Now, some people are sceptical and think he might uh, put his hat into the ring later on. But look at it from this point of view. He's already stabled the market just by being appointed Minister of Finance, Chancellor of the Exchequer. And in a way, the incoming Prime Minister will be beholden to Jeremy Hunt, who wields a lot of power behind the scenes. We can already see that. Right. So in a way, he's the only member of the current cabinet who can be guaranteed to be kept on in his role. That's my view. Now, I may be wrong, and he may jump into the ring in the next day or two, but my sus suspicion is that the next Prime Minister will either be Rishi Sunak or Penny Mordaunt, right. and the next Chancellor of the Exchequer will be Jeremy Hunt, because he's sitting in the job already, doing a very good job, according to members of Parliament. Right, Nicholas, talking about the state of governance right now, in the past few months, it has been compared to a revolving door of chaos. All this when, as we've been reporting, the British people are battling rising costs. Is there any faith in leadership at this point, no matter who takes on the top job? Not a lot, it has to be said. We have been considerably, um, uh, I don't know, perhaps even scandalised by the way the Conservative Party have handled things over the last months or perhaps three months since Boris Johnson was 
defenestrated effectively because members of parliament voted against him. So the whole political process has uh, come into uh, question. Um, frankly, the party has been rather humiliated by choosing leaders that have a short shelf life, have not lasted long. After all, we had Theresa May, then we had Boris Johnson, now we've had Liz Truss, shorter tenure than any of her predecessors. We've really got through prime ministers so rapidly in the last few years. Why is that? Is that because we're choosing the wrong one? It would rather look like that. And yet Boris Johnson won a massive election victory, so he had everything going for him, but he lost it. And the people, and I don't just mean conservative supporters, but the people at large, lost their confidence in him. Liz Truss has beaten that record. She has lost the confidence of the people, members of parliament and the people at large within six weeks. It's 45 days today. So um, it'll be... Uh, uh, that hence, hence, the party have decided on a very rapid transfer this time. Instead of allowing the same three months to choose a new leader, they promised to do it within one week. And my suspicion is that once it is clear who the final two are, and they have a vote on the final two, my suspicion is that the second one will drop out, and thus the transition will be even more rapid than the one week they're talking about. Right. I may be wrong. Right, Nicholas. Thank you so much for all those predictions and insights. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. Now, no matter how this contest ends, it is Rishi Sunak who's having the last laugh. Not only is he the favorite to win, it seems he's also got some much needed redemption. Allow me to explain. You see, even before Liz Truss became the Prime Minister, Sunak had warned the Tories about the dangers of her policies. He had flagged that his rival's unfunded tax-cutting plan could trigger a financial meltdown in the country. He had made some ominous forecasts, warning that such trussonomics could increase borrowing to dangerous levels. Besides adding fuel to the fire of rising costs, in other words, Sunak saw it coming. But back then, he was ridiculed for this. He was dismissed as a pessimist and labelled a doomster for voicing these views. From his fellow MPs to senior Tory leaders, even to the British media. They all lambasted Sunak for being too negative. That's exactly what they called him. We wonder what Sunak is thinking right now because everything he predicted from sky-high borrowing levels to abysmally high rate of inflation to a worsening cost of living crisis to an ever-spiralling national debt, heightened risk of recession, the UK is experiencing it all. And the leader... He predicted he would miss this, who would cause this mess, is now out of office and out of favor. It's quite a fascinating turn of events for Sunak. It's more like an I told you so moment. But he's not bragging despite earning the rights to. He's quietly letting Tory MPs do their work to elect him. In fact, Sunak has been very quiet in recent weeks. Suspiciously quiet. What's he up to? No one knows. But the silence is helping. Because even without saying anything, even without making a public appearance, Sunak is still the favourite to win. The 42-year-old is getting support from all corners. From the people, the media, even lawmakers. They're all rooting for Sunak to be Prime Minister. According to reports, former Chief Whip Julian Smith has been in touch with Tory MPs to build support for Rishi Sunak. Mel Stride and other Sunak supporters even hosting dinners for MPs to seek support. Sunak is also the bookmaker's favourite. Now what are they? They're simply people who bet on certain individuals to win. Most of them are placing their bets on Rishi Sunak. So to put it simply, Liz Truss's exit from office is good news for Rishi Sunak. The voters want him to be Prime Minister. His colleagues want him to be Prime Minister as well. Even bookmakers are batting for him. So if he does manage to succeed, he will be the UK's first Indian origin Prime Minister. But as soon as he takes office, that is assuming he might, he will have a tough task at hand. Turning the UK economy around. Yes, his experience and skills might help him fare better than Liz Truss, but with British politics getting more divisive every day, with new camps being formed within Conservatives, and with the war still underway in Eastern Europe, Sunak will have a very short window to prove himself. I repeat, this is all assuming that he will win the race to 10 Downing.
They say leadership in the UK is a poison chalice. It comes easily but is difficult to sustain. What happened to Liz Truss is just another reminder that the top office isn't always the gift it seems to be. Because since time immemorial, British Prime Ministers have had to depart way before they, com they completed their tenure. Let's now take a look at some of them. The first name on the list is George Canning, a Conservative leader, a former Foreign Secretary and the former Prime Minister of the UK. He was elected to office in April 1827, but served for just 119 days of his life. Why? Because he died of tuberculosis while in office. Today he lies buried in Westminster Abbey. The second name on the list is Fed it's Frederick John Robinson, also known as the Viscount Godrich. He was a member of Britain's land-owning aristocracy. He managed to enter politics through his family connections. He even managed to become the country's prime minister, but could only serve for a total of 144 days because he was unable to hold his fragile coalition together. So he resigned and distanced himself from politics. The third name on the list is of Andrew Bonalow, a conservative politician who is the only Canadian to serve as the prime minister of the UK. He was born in the British colony of New Brunswick, which is now a Canadian province. Historians call him the unknown Prime Minister because he served for just 211 days between October 1922 and May 1923. He resigned on grounds of ill health after he was diagnosed with terminal throat cancer. The fourth name on the list is William Cavendish, the third Duke of Devonshire and the great-great-great-great-great-grandfather of King Charles III. He served as a Prime Minister from November 1756 to June 1757, just 225 days. He was replaced along with his ministers for mishandling state affairs. The fifth name on this list is of William Petty Fitzmaurice. He was the UK's first Home Secretary and then the Prime Minister from 1782 to 1783. This was during the final months of the American War of Independence. He succeeded in securing peace with America but failed to secure his own seat. He was driven out of office by his own lawmakers. He served for just 266 days. The sixth name on this list is John Stuart, the third Earl of Root. He was a British nobleman and arguably the last important royal favorite in British politics. He was the UK's first Prime Minister from Scotland, serving from May 1762 to April 1763. But he had to resign for deferring from his lawmakers' political positions. He served for a total of 317 days. And the last name on this list is of Sir Alec Douglas Holm, a British Conservative politician who served from 1963 to 1964, a period of 363 days just too short of completing a year. He assumed office after his predecessor fell ill. His tenure ended with the Labour Party winning the elections that followed. But Liz Truss has beaten all these seven names to become the shortest serving Prime Minister ever. Whether she will leave behind a legacy as rich as these gentlemen is yet to be seen. Now, for the last few hours, our focus has been the turmoil ongoing in UK politics. But let's now show you what else made news. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. The London stock market and the pound bounce after British Prime Minister Liz Truss announced her resignation following controversial policies that rocked the markets for weeks. The United States will discuss North Korea's recent missile launches along with security issues related to China and Taiwan at a meeting with officials from Japan and South Korea. Russia claims the West is seeking to put pressure on Tehran with accusations that Moscow is using Iran-made drones in Ukraine. Meanwhile, the European Union agrees on sanctions against three individuals and one entity supplying Iranian drones to Russia that have been used to bomb Ukraine. India issues advisory asking its citizens to avoid traveling to Ukraine, cites deteriorating security situation in the country. 
The large dome of a grand mosque in Indonesia's capital, Jakarta, collapsed after a major fire, without causing any casualties. The cause of the fire, which took hours to extinguish, is under investigation. Turkey's central bank cuts its policy rate for the third consecutive month despite a plunging lira and an annual inflation rate that has soared over 83%. The falling yen hits 150 per dollar for the first time since 1990, driven down by the contrast between Japanese monetary easing and aggressive US rate hikes. Meanwhile, the Indian rupee too hits an all-time low, crossing 83 to the dollar. Birkenbag maker Hermes flags plans to hike prices by 5-10% in 2023 on rising costs and currency fluctuations, after a sharp rise in sales over the third, with no signs of any slowdown yet. Sri Lanka and Netherlands have booked their spot in the Super 12 stage of the ongoing World Cup. Sri Lanka joined Group A following their 16-run win over the Netherlands. The Dutch advanced following the United Arab Emirates' 7-run win over Namibia. They slot into Group B alongside India, Pakistan, South Africa and Bangladesh. Cristiano Ronaldo left Old Trafford before the final whistle after being an unused substitute in Manchester United's 2-0 win over Tottenham Hotspur. The 37-year-old watched from the bench as his United teammates defeated Antonio Conte's side 2-0. Now, it's been quite a dramatic day in UK politics, but as we wrap up Gravitas, I leave you with some memes. And yes, the lettuce has outlived the UK Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. Gone. Corporation tax cut. Gone. 20p tax cut. Gone. Two year energy freeze. Gone. Tax free shopping. Gone. Economic credibility. Gone. And her supposed best friend, the formula chancellor. He's gone. Gone. I am resigning. In December, I'll be in Beijing, opening up new pork markets. <laughs>